That's a tool of the devil! Hello, 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 and welcome back to a brand new business blaze. This brand new business blaze is brought to you by Surfshark. Uh, Surfshark is a VPN. You can uh, go to surfshark.deals forward slash blaze and use the code blaze and you'll get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. If you're new here, welcome. What happens is uh, Danny, the finest scriptwriter on YouTube, writes me a script. I shall read it. The worst YouTuber on YouTube. And Sam. You're not a fucking legend at all. You're a naughty, 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 naughty boy. <laughs> the video editor, or memeologist, as we like to refer to him here at Business Place, will add some memes, and let's get into it. This one is talking pictures and other passing fads. I have no idea what talking pictures are. That's because they were a passing fad, like uh, Tamagotchis and yo-yos. I am dating myself. <laughs> I very much grew up in the 1990s. Tamagotchis were so sh Whoever thought that was a good idea? I remember having a Tamagotchi, and I was like, oh my god, it's like a real pet. And it's not. And it's not at all. In any way whatsoever. It's terrible. Some people get very fussy about what kind of film they're willing to watch. My mate, Fat Barry, will only watch superhero films, which are in 3D and have an absolute maximum running time of 90 minutes. About the same length of time he gets him, takes him to leisurely polish off two family buckets of popcorn. I don't know, are there any superhero movies that are in 3D that are 90 minutes long? I've never seen any. You know, everyone's like, Simon, it's just like that. You're like, <laughs> someone the other day was like, you're the Thanos of YouTube channels. And I'm like, I've no idea what you're talking about. And then I found that he collects rings or some shit like that. Or uh, not rings, these magic stones that go on his fingers. And I'm like, one, boy, there is nothing I care about less. The only time I ever looked into seeing those movies, I was like, okay, okay, look, I could go see Tin Man run around shoot. Why is this chair here? I just realized I saw this. I could go watch Tin Man shooting things out of his face and uh, see if I like it. I'm not probably not going to. Let's be honest, probably not going to. But then I looked at the running time and it's like 470 minutes. And I'm like, well, one, cinema, why do you never put this in just hours and minutes? Why do I have to always do the calculation myself? And two, fuck that. The idea of watching anything in black and white or with subtitles would have him waddling far away into the almost immediate distance. Then again, a more hipster mate of mine will only devote his time to non-linear three-hour black and white foreign language musicals about war with Korean subtitles. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, non-linear. I mean, I could tolerate three hours. I could tolerate black and white. I can tolerate th uh, foreign language. Oh no, there's a mu I can't tolerate musicals and I can't tolerate non-linear storylines. It's just like, why, why? Why? It's hard enough to follow anyway. I was watching an action movie the other day. I was thinking it was like an old James Bond movie and I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. It's like, I guess I'm pretty dim. But they do make them really complicated. I'm like, what, what's go who's the bad guy again? Why does he want to do this? Why is he always telling James Bond the plan just before he tries to kill him? Also, what was up with that, uh, the last James Bond movie where he's like having his head drilled with little screws and then all of this stuff and it's like, this will really damage your brain. Ah, Mr. Bond. Whatever. But then five minutes later, he's escaped and he's flying a helicopter and it's like, well, it didn't damage his brain that bad, did it? Because he can still remember how to fly a helicopter like five minutes afterwards. <laughs> Whatever your own preference, there's not many people around nowadays who would argue that hearing spoken dialogue in a movie is a bad idea. Uh, without, why is Danny capitalized bad idea? I'm guessing there's some movie or joke that I'm missing here. Because it's not like Danny's just randomly capitalized words in a sentence. It would probably be more difficult to fully comprehend the twists and turns of narrative in the compelling classics like Citizen Kane, The Shawshank Redemption, and Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. The classics of cinema. Yet, back, I've not seen Citizen Kane. I have seen The Shawshank Redemption, it's pretty good. Uh, Mon Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed. <laughs> No, just no. Uh, look, I haven't seen any kids' movies. I mean, since I was a kid. I've not seen any of those Frozen movies or the Disney stuff. What, they got music in it. I've not seen, like, any of the new Pocahontas sh I've not seen, uh, what's that big one? I've seen Toy Story. I haven't seen any of the other ones. I've not seen Shrek or any of the other ones. I've not seen any of this shit. Shrek is love, I say. Shrek is life. Yet back when talkies were first widely introduced in the late 1920s, the entire foolish concept seemed to deeply annoy the movie stars, the critics, and even a big chunk of cinema audiences for years. Oh, wait, I guess this must be sarcastic, because talky pictures, does that refer to like, Movies where people could talk rather than, you know, there's some da 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 da
Yes, all right. Why would it ever catch on? Why would something like real life be, be, be worse? 19, the 1927 musical, musical drama The Jazz Singer is widely recognized as the first talkie to really take off. Although people had been messing around with the idea of marrying images to sound ever since Thomas Edison first experimented with synchronizing phonographs and kinetoscopes back in 1885. The 1926 film Don Juan was one of the first films to synchronize moving pictures with a full-length soundtrack, although this didn't feature any dialogue. Instead, it features no less than 127 kissing scenes, and it sounds bloody awful. What? <laughs> what is going on? I don't even understand. But The Jazz Singer was the first major blockbuster to include lip-synchronous dialogue. What a revolution. <laughs> Albeit in just a few sequences, and it's now considered to be the movie that spearheaded the talkie revolution. But it was a surprisingly slow revolution. And many people were quick to dismiss early talkies as nothing more than a passing novelty gimmick which was destined to be forgotten when the audience inevitably grew tired of all the noise and chatter. Yeah, this is like 3D movies. I remember the first 3D movie I saw was like, you know, other than that Michael Jackson thing at Disney when I was a kid, was Avatar, which one f sucks. Like, Avatar is the biggest stinking pile of sh movie that I've ever seen. Like, oh boy. Also, it, I saw it in 3D and I was like, oh, why? It's just worse. And I was like, this must, this must pass. And it's like, still, there are still 3D movies. I've not seen a single one since I saw Avatar. Oh, that's not true. I saw one of the Star Trek movies in 3D. Um, just because it was the time that worked for me and I regretted it. And many people were quick to dismiss early talkies as nothing more than a passing novelty gimmick which was destined to be forgotten when the audience inevitably grew tired of all the noise and chatter. Some viewers described talkies as box office freaks or squeakies and passionately believed that silence was golden. Headlines in the press ran along the lines of beauty lost in talkies and talking films try movie men's souls while British film studio boss John Maxwell described the whole concept as a passing fad. It wasn't. Spoiler alert. Look, I mean, you're watching this right now. How great would Business Plays be if it was just me going like this? And then, like, some text would just scroll across the screen that reads... United Artists President John Schneck publicly declared talking doesn't belong in pictures. I don't think people want talking pictures for long. Also, I mean, at the beginning, it was also really annoying because they all had weird accents. They talked a bit like this. And many movie stars weren't particularly happy either. When a massive fire broke out at Paramount Lot in 1929, actress Clara Bow is reported to have quipped, I hope to Christ, it was the sound stages. <laughs> Why? Why did you have to talk like this? This mid-Atlantic bull... Oh, for God's sake. And of course, Charlie Chaplin famously resisted the urge to speak on the silver screen for well over a decade. He said, The silent picture is a universal means of expression. Talking pictures necessarily have a limited field. They are held down to the particular tongue of to the particular tongues of particular races. Well, that's true, I guess, before subtitles. But also, I mean, wasn't really that important. Or I I mean, and obviously, he was wrong. <laughs> It's not hard to understand why so many of the silent actors were dismissive of talkies. For starters, it signaled the end of the careers of a whole bunch of them who failed to make the transition because their untrained voices weren't up to scratch or they had distinctive accents which didn't match up to the roles they were required to play. Yeah, this must be incredibly disappointing. <laughs> you have a terrible voice and you're like a stunningly handsome man or a beautiful woman. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, we need you to talk in this thing. It's like, oh no, that's not gonna go well at all, is it? I said, I'm done, done. <laughs> it also meant a whole new way of working, which the production teams found to be quite awkward. Film sets had previously been lively and noisy environments in which the director was free to bark out instructions even when the cameras were rolling. But now, the sets had to be deathly quiet during filming, and actors felt more restricted as they had to make sure their voices were getting clearly picked up at all times by hidden microphones. Actors complained that this created a stiff and less spontaneous dynamic, while critics pondered over whether motion pictures had lost their motion. But a boom, boom, 1920s joke. Weak. 
Perhaps most importantly of all, there was a general feeling that this was all part of a perversion of cinema, which had been happily and silently entertaining audiences for decades without the need for spoken language. The medium was originally meant to be all about body language and visual expression. It's a bit like the Louvre Museum making a decision to only display paintings which come packaged with a press me button for extra sound effects to accompany the visuals on a show. Okay, I kind of get it, because you've been doing something for so long, it's something that everyone likes, and then like 3D comes along, and you're like, what the f and now it's a thing. Um, I get it. I get it. I mean, in retrospect, it's like, really, guys? <laughs> really? And I'm making a lot of fun of them. But, uh, but I get it. You can only imagine that some traditional art lovers would find this a bit odd. I'd find it better. Like, just go to these and you press it, and, like, the Mona Lisa makes a sound. I don't know what that sound would be. Maybe, like, where are my eyebrows? Something like that. That would be cool. The one problem is that the technology wasn't really there yet for very early talkies, which is why they're all absolute rubbish. It was only during the 1930s that studios really got to grips with new sound recording techniques and started making movies that people would actually enjoy watching and hearing. Places like Europe and Japan were still very slow to embrace the changeover to this new fangled camps theater, but American cinemas had seen a drastic surge in admissions during the rise of talkies, jumping from 57 million uh, to 110 million in in the space of just a few years. That is a massive jump. People are like, nah, it's not very good, it's not really working. Twice as many people are going to the cinema. I guess it's working! By the end of the decade, silent films were a relic of yesteryear, as talkies finally became the newly accepted face of global cinema. The naysayers had been well and truly silenced on the potential attractions of talky pictures, even if it certainly didn't happen overnight, and it took a while for studios and audiences to adapt to the new sound of cinema. But it's not the only time in history that a groundbreaking new concept or invent- See, look, if this was a normal YouTube video, we'd end it here. But we're just getting started! Because this is The Blaze. I am your boy with The Blaze. Welcome. There's like eight more of these or whatever. Take a seat. Pour a cup of coffee. Roll a split. But it's not the only time in history that groundbreaking new concepts or innovations destined to change the shape of the future was initially quite sniffily dismissed as a foolish passing fad. What the fork? Wait, I'm not sure if this is about things that people thought were fads that are actually things, or whether we're now going to look at things which were actually fads. I'm so confused. I don't even remember. What, I, I usually come up with most of these ideas and I send them to Danny, and uh, I, it's been weeks, so I've, I've forgotten. <laughs> Some new ideas take a little while to really catch on with the public, but in the case of the personal table fork, it took well over a millennium to get. Oh, okay, it's uh, it, it's things that did end up catching on because, well, most of us use forks. <laughs> uh, using a tool. Uh, millennium to convince diners that using this tool wasn't necessarily an act of blasphemy. Oh my god. The origins of the dinner fork probably stretch way back to the beginning of the Byzantine Empire, or the Eastern Roman Empire in the 4th century BC, but it wasn't until the 10th century that they were introduced to Europe for the first time. But back then, most of us were still quite happy to stuff our faces using a combination of a knife with a pointed tip to spear the feud, food, a communal spoon in our dirty fingers. It does kind of sound awesome. What, you don't have any for you just stab everything with a knife. There's some debate as to which Byzantine princess was responsible for introducing the table fork to the European dinner table. Some say it was, oh for fuck's sake, Theophano Sclera Sclerena? Maybe. The wife of Holy Roman Emperor Otto II, who first whipped out the strange pronged utensil on a European visit during the 10th century. <laughs> Wait, didn't they say it was blasphemous? Someone's like, THAT'S A TOOL OF THE DEVIL! I guess it kind of looks like it, because he has a pitchfork, right? So people will be eating with like a- or did the pitchfork come afterwards? I don't know. Don't care either. <laughs> Not gonna look that up right. Others claim that it was more likely to be Maria Argy someone who turned up at her wedding to the Doge of Venice uh, in 1004 with a case of golden forks and then got them out at the wedding feast. Either way, you could have picked up the atmosphere with a communal spoon. At the -bum 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 at the lighter end of criticism, both princesses were ridiculed for using what appeared to be a pointed and excessively lavish substitute for your own fingers. <laughs> that people just work, it's like, why are you using that? You've got perfectly good fingers. It's like, I don't know. I don't want to get COVID and shit, or whatever, you know, the 9th century equivalent of COVID was. 11th century. It's always confusing which way round those go. On a more serious, or perhaps more ludicrous note, the fork ended up getting banned by the Roman Catholic Church, as using these metal artificial fingers was deemed to be an insult to the Almighty's perfectly good design of the human hand. <laughs> it's now for fuck's sake. 
Then get off your horse. Your legs work perfectly fine. Be a good Luddite. Poor old Maria, whatever her name was, died from the plague just a couple of years after our wedding in Venice, and St. Peter Damien paid her a less glowing tribute. He said, Nor did she deign to touch the food with her fingers, but would command her eunuchs to cut it up into small pieces, which she would impale on a certain golden instrument with two prongs, and thus carry to her mouth. The woman's vanity was hateful to Almighty God, and so unmistakably did he take his revenge, for he raised over the sword of his divine justice, so that her whole body did purify, putrefy, and her limbs began to wither. That's a really descriptive way of describing plague. I hope you got it yourself. Imagine what he might have said if the heathen had whipped out a bendy straw for her wedding milkshake. Butter bum bum. Hilarious. Hundreds of years later, the dinner fork did eventually make its way onto Italian and French dinner tables. It may have been helped a little by King Louis XIV of France, who in 1669 decreed that table knives with pointed tips were henceforth illegal to combat the risk of violence erupting during a typical French family dinner. This prompted more of a need for a replacement tool with pointy bits to spear the food in the fork rapidly gains popularity across Europe. But surprisingly, it took Britain a lot longer than the European neighbors to accept the fork, and it wasn't until the First World Fair in 1851 that the fork was finally accepted onto the British dinner table. These days, the fork remains a distinctly Western dining tool. Yeah, Asian countries use chopsticks and their hands and all sorts of weird like, I don't know, I like a knife and fork. But also, you can always get, like, I, I've spent time in Asia and I've been to like a bunch of different countries where they don't eat with knives and forks. There's always the option. Like, unless you're in some random ass place, even in the most random ass place, they'll, they'll find a fork. There's gonna be a fork somewhere. And then you're like, oh my God, because <laughs> this is complicated. <laughs> and although it may have been ridiculed or condemned for a millennium before it finally gained acceptance over the last few hundred years, it may not be around forever. Thanks to the rise of fast food restaurants, we're now eating whole meals with our hands again for the first time since the 16th century. It may soon be time to abandon the fork and return it to the monstrous bowels of hell from whence it came. And what has not come from the bowels of hell, but has been sent like manna from heaven is today's glorious sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark sent from heaven. Okay, look, you use the internet, you're on the internet right now. We've discussed this before. It's not a logical leap. The next logical leap you do need to make though is, uh, oh, I'm on the internet. There's dodgy people on the internet. Maybe Russians hacking your and I Suka, 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 blade, suka, 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 blade. In the movies, it's always the Russians. In when it's on the news, it's always the Russians. It's the Russians. Don't let them hack your shit. You need to get some Surfshark on the case. Uh, Surfshark.deals forward slash blaze, by the way, if you've already been sold. If you're like, whoa, 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 Simon. <laughs> You are the king of salesmen, and I've already decided that I'd like to support the Blaze, the business Blaze, not the, the right-wing news channel, uh, by getting Surfshark. Well, mwah, thank you very much. There's a link below. But for those of you who haven't been already sold, well, let me tell you about Hacklock. Mm -hmm. That keeps you safe online. It searches databases for your passwords, which, I mean, We've discussed all this before, but maybe you're new here and you've not heard me say this, but it's like, that sounds a bit dodgy, doesn't it? You're like, wait, are Surfshark actually the Russians? Are they the ones hacking my sh**? Well, no, they're the good guys. They're looking to see if it's out there so they can warn you so you can change your passwords and, uh, and well, just keep those Russians out, okay? Uh, and then, what else is your VPN good for? We talked about this as well, okay? If you haven't done this yet, what's wrong with you? Like, you're watching Netflix and you're like, Phew. Netflix is lame. They've only got like a million shows and I've watched them all because I'm massively addicted to Netflix, especially during COVID because, you know, what else are we going to do? Also, once you've paid, you can watch as much as you like for free, which is great. This isn't an ad for Netflix, Simon. Get your together. You can use uh, Surfshark VPN. You like flip that switch over to like some other country and you can see what they've got on Netflix. For me, that's great because, you know, there's the UK, there's the US, there's, I don't know, I've not tried it, but Japan. Maybe, maybe you're like really into manga or some <laughs> Sam is, he edits these, he always puts these manga memes. Look, just go get Surfshark, it's great. You'll get 83% off, you get three months for free. There's a link in the description below. Uh, and it's unlimited. I should say it's unlimited, which is obviously awesome. Surfshark, support the show. Support business place, support Surfshark. Mwah! Answering machines. Back in the early 1990s, just about everyone I knew had an answering machine or a telephone messaging machine. I can remember that I only bought my first machine, complete with a tiny micro cassette, when I launched my dating agency called Perfect Partners. Danny, we've discussed your dating agency before. This is very interesting. People love, whenever a little nugget of Danny's life comes forth from the ground on a Business Blaze episode, people are like, ooh, Danny's life. Mmm, 
Mm. Well, we're about to learn more. I also remember as a kid, my parents had one of those uh, answering machines that would have that tiny little cassette that looked like it would go in a dictaphone or something in it. Potential Lonely Hearts clients would see my classified advent in the Rover and Record and then dial my telephone number to request free information. Free information pack and brochure, all printed in glorious full color on my Commodore 64. I figured it would be a good idea to invest in an answering machine, partly so that I didn't miss any calls when I was out boozing all my profits away down the pub. At least he's honest about it. <laughs> You've called Perfect Partners. Unfortunately, I'm out of the office right now. I'm getting absolutely based down the pub with the money that you'll hopefully be giving me. Just leave your name and number. We'll get right back to you. Assume I'm not desperately hungover. But I also let my machine answer the calls even when I was in. <laughs> I thought it would come across as more professional and avoid any natural awkwardness about the request. Instead of getting greeted by a younger version of me scrabbling around for a pen, the clients were greeted by a soothing female voice who invited them to leave their details against the backdrop of gently inquiring, inspiring music. For me, the answering machine was a game changer. It's like, yeah, when you want to appeal... <laughs> if someone called me, it's just me in this office. Like, there's no one here. When anyone ever calls me, I'd be like, Hello, Simon Whistler's office! <laughs> and it should really have been a game changer for everyone else throughout the whole of the 20th century. Looking back now, the idea of being able to receive vocal messages during those times when you can't answer the phone seems so obvious and logical and essential. Yet despite Vladimir Paulson inventing the telegraphone, 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 oh no, who cares, the world's first automatic telephone answering machine way back in 1890, holy sh**. Just a few years after the invention of the actual telephone, the concept took about a century to become, common, to become a common household device. This was partly because the early devices were massive, clunky, wildly expensive, and didn't even connect to the telephone line, which, I mean, I kind of feel like that's an essential feature. As late as the 1960s, companies were trying to shift piss-poor products like the Telephone Valet from Lafayette Electronics. This would set you back about $140 over a grand in today's money. <laughs> I love how things are basically free now. Like, I don't even have an answering machine. Wait, I'm not sure I need an answering machine. <laughs> I don't, like, if someone calls my phone and I don't answer, it doesn't take them to, like, a voicemail. It just hangs up on them. And I'm like, just call me back. Send me a text message. I definitely not pay a grand for it. As it didn't connect to the telephone line, it worked on vibrations. You plonked your phone on top of the mighty machine, which would detect when the phone was ringing and then temporarily popped up the cradle of the phone so that it was in line with the machine's speaker. Okay, I kind of get how that works. It was very fiddly to set up. You couldn't record your own outgoing messages, and you had to make do with a default message from a Japanese woman, and the person at the other end did a maximum of 60 seconds to get their message across before the tape recorder cut them off. 60 seconds is bloody plenty time enough, actually, thank you very much. Like, if I, could, if I, if I had an answering machine, and someone left me a message that was 60 seconds long, I'd be like, what the f***? How can you talk to yourself for 60 seconds? Welcome to Business Blaze, where I do it for, like, up to 60 minutes sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> boy. Not only that, the vibration detection was so sensitive that the telephone valet would often spring into life if you just closed the fridge door or shouted at the cat. Classic everyday activities. <laughs> I mean, closing the fridge door, yes. Shouting at the cat. I don't have a cat. I doubt I'd shout at it if, uh, I doubt, I doubt, what, it's a cat. What's it gonna do? It's not like shouting at a dog where the dog's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the cat's like, <laughs> I don't need your sh in later decades, the technology improved, but there was still a big barrier to using answering machines in the United States. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, oh, I had no idea that's what it stands for. There you go, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, enjoyed a complete monopoly on the telephone service, and any new recording devices had to be approved by them. Ah, oh, monopolies, brilliant for business. And they were quite scornful about the whole idea, declaring that there is no need for the device. How about you let your customers be, oh no, wait, you've got a monopoly. You don't need to care what your customers think. Monopolies. Brilliant for business. They effectively banned answering machines from US households, claiming that the devices posed a hazard line hazard to line repairmen, which of course is complete bollocks, yeah, dude. It's more likely they didn't see enough profit in it for themselves and preferred customers to use AT&T's own live answering services instead. <laughs> Probable. Probable. Allegedly. The answering machines did eventually start appearing in European offices in the 1970s, although they were seen as an overexpensive yuppie annoyance. But it <laughs> imagine what the flex was you got an answering machine. Ah, flexes of the past. Look at my phone. It's absolutely massive. It comes in its own carrying case. It wasn't until the dissolution of AT&T in 1984 that US customers were finally given the freedom to buy whatever equipment they wanted for their own damn telephones, and this sparked a boom in the industry. And it wasn't until 
until the early 1990s that answering machines finally lost their yuppie tag, as the New York Times helpfully announced in a 1991 edition that affordable answering machines were now for plain folks too. It just seems a shame that it took so long for answering machines to catch on when they could have been one of the most useful everyday household devices of the whole last century. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Is it that important? Is that, oh no, I missed your call. If you've got something really important to say, you're going to call me back. If you don't, you're going to leave a message that I might not hear, so... By the time they finally grew popular, the devices only had a couple of decades of shelf life before they were rendered, rendered completely obsolete by the arrival of voicemail. Voicemail is an answering machine, isn't it, basically? Like, you don't answer the phone, so it picks up. It's an answering machine. I'm so confused. This is way too 90s for me. Umbrellas. Who would have thought this was a passing fad? Umbrellas are brilliant. It's only just occurred to me that I've never owned an umbrella in my life. Oh. <laughs> Danny doesn't agree with me. He, I guess he thinks umbrellas are a bit shit. I've owned a million umbrellas because I leave that, like, I'll go through maybe two umbrellas a winter because I'll just be, you know, down at the pub getting absolutely shit-faced and I'll leave my umbrella there and then I'll be like, yeah, I could go back and get it, but I don't remember which pub I was in. And Danny is very rarely ducked under any else's. I bet Simon buys a new umbrella every year. <laughs> oh, Danny! Well, I genuinely haven't read this ahead of time. Uh, but I've always found them to be a bit too much faffing about. It was raining outside, just put on a coat with a hood. I seem to remember seeing pl plenty of umbrellas out there on the streets when I was younger, but I only tend to see a few pensioners using them these days. Maybe it's a dying industry, or maybe only Americans are still using them. What are you talking about, Danny? People use umbrellas all the time. I have separate, I have, I have an umbrella at home, probably two, because I'm gonna lose one. I have an, a big, a big golf umbrella in my car, not because I play golf, but because, you know, it's good to have a giant umbrella in your car, because it just is. Although the roots of the parasol probably stretch parasol, I guess that's the OG word for umbrella, stretch all the way back to the Aztecs. The first, oh wait, is the parasol the thing that keeps you shaded from the sun? Which I never got. And you always see like Chinese people using these. Like, I don't know why, but Chinese people, like I've been to China, they're always using those things. I get it now. I went to China. It was like 40 f degrees Celsius, which is, I don't know, like a hundred and billion Fahrenheit. It was goddamn hot every day. And everyone's like walking around with umbrellas. <laughs> And I'm like, what's up with it? Oh, oh, yeah, pretty smart. That was goddamn hot. That was the hottest trip I've ever been on. The first modern lightweight folding umbrellas for the modern man first started appearing in Paris in the 18th century, except that they weren't perceived as being for men at all, and that was part of the problem. For some reason, it was generally believed back then that only women were affected by the rain. <laughs> a man and a woman arrive home from a walk. The man in the pouring rain. The man's just completely f***ing dry. Just the rain just portals around him. Like, he's in sort of, sort of force field. And the woman's just completely soaked. Like, oh, how did this happen? John, how the f*** are you so dry? And Kersey's dictionary at the time even defined the umbrella as a screen commonly used by women to keep rain off. The idea of a red-blooded male whipping out an umbrella on the streets of London would have just seemed absurd and would have openly invited ridicule. <laughs> I have to say, one of my umbrellas is a giant flower. Like, it opens up and it looks like a giant flower and it's bright pink and purple. Ha! Gay! Because it's my wife's umbrella, but I've, I, I, I've lost mine as we've discussed, or I can't often find it. So I'll just take her purple umbrella, which I haven't managed to lose, I think because I'm like, well, she's gonna be upset if I lose it. So I've actually managed to hold on to that one. The horse-drawn carriage industry didn't really take uh, two umbrellas either. The grumpy drivers, the bloke at the front, not the horses. <laughs> yeah, Danny, we know. Uh, felt that umbrellas were a risk to their jobs, as people could potentially just put up an umbrella at the first sign of rain, instead of hailing one of the carriages, which usually did brisk business on days when it was pissing it down. <laughs> when cars came along, they were like, <laughs> oh. God! And in fact, early umbrella adopters had to deal with the social stigma of being considered a vulgar peasant. Oh no. Oh, you d dirty peasants. Owning an umbrella was seen as compelling evidence that you were too poor to afford a carriage on a rainy day. So any man walking around the rain-drenched streets of London with an umbrella would generally be at risk of getting sneered at for being a weak, effeminate ruffian. One of the very first men to dare to take the risk was a bloke called Jonas Hanway, who was the founder of the Magdalen Hospital. Oh, hello everybody. Uh, interruption. Because, for this part, my microphone stopped working. I don't know why, it just got really janky and the sound went horrible, so, uh... I'm just jumping in from the future, I'm wearing a different shirt. I obviously could have matched it up, but I decided not to. So I can promote something else, because I'm a good capitalist. PerchTheMerch.co He bought an umbrella during a trip to Paris, and he was happy to carry it around with him every day back home in London. Even though this meant he had to endure a torrent of abuse during every jolly stroll outdoors. Pedestrians would shout at him, Frenchman! Frenchman, why don't you call a coach? They're probably less aggressive about it and more like in a joking way. Uh, but I like my shouting version. While others would actually throw rubbish at him. 
It's a bit harsh. One particularly unhappy carriage rider even went as far as to try and run him over with his coach and horses, an incident which very nearly killed Jonas on no. Umbrellas in Britain didn't really begin to gain acceptance until the very end of the 17th century when London newspapers began running advertisements for new improved pocket umbrellas and sales began to take flight. I feel there is a joke in there. Does didn't Mary Poppins do something with the thing and the flight? Go on then. But a pop pop but that's surprising, but that's a surprisingly long time for the British to put up with being wet while their European cousins had to take to the umbrella decades earlier. However, the stigma never completely pan it vanished, and even today, some males see umbrellas as a bit effeminate. No one thinks that. <laughs> I just very rarely see them at all. Really? <laughs> Mobile phones! We've been accused of pandering to the American language in recent episodes of Business Plays, and so in this final section, I just want to take a quick look at mobile phones, even though cell phones would probably be a slightly cooler name. It's one thing to invent something which is initially dismissed as a fad by the sniffy public or even sniffier experts, but it's quite another to invent a device which will completely transform human communication and then dismiss it yourself as being a bit of a crap waste of time. Wow. Although mobile telephony has been installed in fancy high-end cars since the 1940s, really? It wasn't until 1973 that a researcher and inventor at Motorola called Marty Cooper designed the world's first, very first mobile handheld telephone device called the Dynatac. As I'm sure you can imagine, and as Sam will probably show us in pictures, uh, it was a huge beast of a device, and it certainly wouldn't fit very snugly in your pocket. And back to regular Simon. But Marty made history when he became the first person in the world to make a call on a handheld cellular device in public at the New York City Hilton in Manhattan. And funnily enough, he decided to phone his biggest rival, Dr. Joel S. Engel, who worked over at AT&T and probably spent most of his days smashing answering machines to bits. I like that. That's a callback. I like it, Danny. I like it. Also, absolute baller move. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, just let you know. Uh, this is from a mobile phone. Dickhead. <laughs> Marty's historic opening gloating words were, Joel, this is Marty. I'm calling you from a cell phone. A real, handheld, portable cell phone. Ya dick. I added the ya dick part. He didn't say that because he's a better man than I. He probably meant mobile phone rather than cell phone. He just got a bit confused in all the excitement. And Dr. Joel's response is unrecorded, but I'd like to think it was something like, oh, piss off, Marty, you showboating little twat. <laughs> I love the word showboating. <laughs> it would be another 10 years before Marty Cooper and his team at Motorola the Dynatac to market. But the weird thing is that his long-term expectations for his fabulous new invention were staggeringly low. The man who became known as the father of the cell phone. Damn, this attempt to stop pandering to the American language isn't really working out at all. When you drink Coca-Cola, you're from fucking America. Initially claimed to a newspaper that cellular phones will absolutely not replace local wire systems, even if you project it beyond our lifetimes. It won't be lifetimes, it won't be cheap enough. Well, he was wrong, wasn't he? And his peers seem to agree with him. Telecoms consultant Jan, 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 I don't know, Jan David J Jabon, oh, seemed convinced that mobile phones would never really take off. He said, Who today will say, I'm gonna ditch the wires in my house and carry the phone around? I don't know, Jan. In everybody. <laughs> Meanwhile, the 1980 report conducted for AT&T concluded that the mobile phone could only be a strictly niche device, which would attract a maximum of 900,000 yuppie users by the year 2000. Uh, oh boy. When we hit the new millennium, the actual figure was 108 million. Today, there are over 5 billion mobile phone users who touch their screens on an, av an average of 2,617 times a day. Yeah, I mean, probably. <laughs> Thankfully, good old Marcy is still around today and saw how his invention went on to smash his own surprisingly low expectations. And he got the chance to eat his doubtful words using a knife with a pointed tip and a communal spoon. But a bum bum tss. This has been Business Plays brought to you by Surfshark. Get that discount. I can't remember the percentage. I think it was 83%. There's a link below. Support the show. Ooh, also. Uh, this, uh, someone designed for me, is the Blaze, Blaze, like business Blaze, in the Enron logo style. So you can pick this up at uh, perchthemerch.co. There is also a link to that below. And thank you for watching.